do a little bit of a shout out about a couple of things. So first, everyone's on board now with the website and the Eventbrite list for signing up for future sessions. So this week I'm going to be adding some more sessions coming up after the end of March. So we have right into July now. And um, if you keep an eye on both the website and the Eventbrite list, we'll, we'll have details of those coming out this week. Um, quick change I want to just tell everybody about for next week. So I'm able to speak next week. Um, so I'm going to step in and in Nino's place, and I'm going to do um, my session about hybrid connectivity options. So that'll be um, the same time next week, but we're just going to do a swap of speaker. Um, at this point, I'm now going to hand over to Kent, who will with his presentation for today. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, Michael. My name is Kent Weir. I'm here to talk to you about what to look for in an integration platform. I'm calling in today from snowy Calgary, Canada, uh, where uh, we're in the middle of winter. So I hope you are in a warmer climate than I am. So just uh, a bit about myself. I've been doing BizTalk for more than 10 years. I've co-authored a few, many different artifacts, including some books and some training kits. Been part of the MVP program for quite a while. I've got experience with some other platforms, including MuleSoft, InterSystems, IBM, and SAP. Uh, from more of a functional standpoint, I've got experience in the insurance, government, utilities, oil and gas, and healthcare sectors. And my day-to-day -day job is a, as a solutions architect for an oil and gas firm uh, here in Canada. So the question is, why this topic? Why do we want to talk about you know, what to look for in an integration platform? And I think you know, part of the reason is definitely related to a lot of the noise that does exist um, in the industry. So we've got... Um, you know, very aggressive search engine optimization campaigns, AdWords, social media, email campaigns, et cetera. And it's resulted in a, a very competitive landscape. And as a result of some disruptive technologies, including mobility, APIs, software as a service, Internet of Things, big data, customers have a lot of choices out there. And I think it's important to develop some awareness around what these options are and, you know, I really enjoy Clemens Vaster's quote here around, um, you know, how being in integration is now cool. So previously we, you know, sat at the back of the office and, you know, we were just in, involved in, in plumbing, whereas nowadays we're really involved in some applications or integrations that really have an impact on the business. And I think that's pretty exciting to be a part of. And I think as a result, it's, it's attracted more and more vendors to this space. So here on the screen is I've got my rendition of a, a magic quadrant. Now don't get too hung up on where exactly a vendor is being placed relative to perhaps where they would show up on that other magic quadrant. But I think the, the important point here is just how competitive this landscape is. Uh, you know, on this screen, we're, we're seeing some of the more traditional players like your Microsoft, your IBMs, your TIBCOs, your um, web methods. Then we're also seeing some more lighter weight players that really only offer uh, integration platform as a service offering, such as Dell Boomi and uh, If This Then That and SnapLogic. So we've got you know, more and more of these new players entering the field. We also have some other vendors uh, who have commercial offerings built around open source platforms such as MuleSoft 
and WSO2. So the, the ultimate question is, okay, how do customers, how are they supposed to choose the right platform? And so within the, this presentation, what I hope to, to get across is 10 different requirements when looking at an integration platform. And you know, these aren't to say these are the only requirements, but certainly these are things that I'd be looking for if I was you know, shopping for an integration platform, whether that be something net new or whether I'm looking to upgrade my existing environment. Uh, after that, I'll get into a, a demo where I address some of these modern integration challenges uh, using the Microsoft stack. Um, also, um, we'll discuss briefly a white paper that myself, Michael Stevenson, and Steph Jan Wiggers wrote uh, earlier, or sorry, late last year. And lastly, we'll have some time for some questions. So the first area that I wanted to, to jump into is in the area of tooling. So as developers, we always want good tools. And I think, you know, it starts with the, the IDE, the um, Integrated Development Environment. And we want to ensure that this tool is, uh, is very polished, is very responsive. And, you know, we don't have to squint our eyes and really, you know, zoom into the screen in order to place a particular widget or a particular component. I also think it's important that, you know, whenever we have properties for a widget or a component, that all of those properties are exposed and, and visible. You know, it's not something where we want to have to, you know, open up some backend configuration file and turn a secret, a secret knob or an undocumented knob. Everything should be up front and center, clean and responsive. Uh, next in the area of administration consoles, uh, you know, for me, I want some visibility into the in-flight and to su suspended messages, the status of those messages. Um, you know, I don't want to have to go look at log files, disparate log files, or have to purchase or procure an additional tool, you know, just to aggregate those log files and give me some visibility into the state of my, my interfaces. From a configuration standpoint, I feel that this is something that you should be able to do you know, after you've deployed your application. You know, some organizations are going to have policies where there may be a password reset, and I don't necessarily want to redeploy my code uh, just to change a particular password or to change a particular setting uh, or property. You know, that's something that, you know, should be able, should be decoupled from the actual code itself. Uh, next is data mappers and the ability to support large messages. I think this hasn't gone away. Um, you know, as, as much as, you know, we're starting to see lighter and lighter integration, having support for large messages is still important. I think extensibility, uh, whether that be through managed code or XSLT is also uh, important. Even recently on a Dynamics AX project, uh, we were in a situation where we had to move from a very hierarchical to a very flat structure when dealing with some um, invoices. And, you know, we needed to, to get outside of the confines of the, the BizTalk map, and XSLT was the right tool for us. And I think, you know, that in addition to some complex mapping, whether that may be taking multiple uh, source documents or messages, perhaps in the case of um, scatter-gather scenarios where we want to take the results of those messages included in a single map to come up with a composite message is also another important aspect of, of data mappers. And you know, for some re uh, for some people who've got a lot of experience, uh, especially in the in the biz talk space, some of these requirements may seem fairly obvious. And uh, what I would suggest is just to hold tight, and we'll get uh, into some of the not so obvious requirements in subsequent slides. But it, it also is important um, not to assume that every integration platform contains all of these these settings. I think if if you're in the business of you know selling software or services. I think there's some, some good awareness here in the sense that, you know, not every platform is going to have these features, so it shouldn't be, you know, considered as being overly obvious. So the next area I want to dive into is PubSub. And in this case, you know, I'm looking for, you know, something out of the box. It, it may not be the most extensive, you know, uh, queue topic in all of the various settings, but I want some element of out of the box PubSub. Uh, if I want to, you know, introduce another subscriber, I don't necessarily want to have to go, you know, procure another tool 
or another messaging platform when I'm paying for you know an integration platform to begin with. So I want some el some element of pub sub. Uh, we also want some loose cup coupling. Um, if I want to add a subscriber, I shouldn't have to you know open up my workflow and add another lane to address that that additional subscriber. And next is is in the area of durable messaging. And I've yet to run into a lot of scenarios where the business has said to me, you know, it's okay, you can lose a message. Um, in fact, it's been quite contrary to that. So if I take a look at, um, you know, my career and some of the different interfaces that I've been involved in building, you know, one has included, uh, you know, processing a million dollar work order. So that's a scenario where I'm not going to want to lose a message. That's pretty important. Um, if you were at the Integrate Summit and you saw, the example where we were, uh, where there was some power being turned on and off remotely. Um, you know, I was involved in building some of those interfaces, and you as a customer wouldn't want that message to be lost. Uh, same thing if you're going through a quoting process um, in the energy sector, and you basically want to get a quote on some infrastructure that needs to be built for your oil and gas wells. That's not a scenario where you want that quote to be lost. Neither is admitting a patient to a hospital or processing invoices. So durable messaging remains to be a, a common requirement for integration platforms. And it's also something that I'd be looking for that was inherent in my platform and not something that I had to rely upon another component or another, another license. Next up, uh, we're gonna talk about exception management. And certainly uh, my expectations would be a lot higher than this particular screenshot. But I thought it was a good way of illustrating the point. And in this case, you know, I don't want to have to roll my own exception management framework. There should be, you know, something out of the box. Like I'm, you know, being paid money to go ahead and drive value for the business. And by me focusing on plumbing, I'm, it's now taking me away from solving the real problem. So that's an important aspect where, you know, I don't want to build my own, accelerate my development, give me some good tooling. In addition to that, it should also be self-service. Um, integration resources are, are busy enough. You know, we don't necessarily want to tra chase down every particular message, especially in a project mode where you're you're iterating and you know errors are going to happen. You know, this is an opportunity where other people participating in that project should get some exposure to these types of events and be able to subscribe to them. In addition to that, I'd be looking to add some sort of classification so I can divert these type of events to a technical audience versus a business SME audience to, in order to eliminate the noise. I think we've all been there where we've got alerting turned on and there's just so much of it that it becomes noise and people then create a, a rule within their mail client and then just forget about it altogether. So I want some granularity in terms of how I can subscribe interested parties. So application isolation is, is the next topic I want to briefly discuss. And in this case, we'll talk about a few different scenarios. So the first being multi-tenancy. I think everyone loves it until their app goes down. So there still needs to be some sort of isolation between my application and your application. And I think going forward, we'll start to see more of that through containers. But it is important where it's not enough to say, well, I'm going to spin up my own server just to run my interfaces because they're really important. Similarly, if I'm going to go ahead and deploy a, an application, you know, I don't want your application to impact mine and vice versa. So there needs to be, you know, some isolation between those from a deployment perspective. Now, some vendors are, you know, treating API management throttling as this solution. And, and I think it, it's, it's part of the solution, but I don't think it's a universal solution. I think unless all of your endpoints are restful, uh, this isn't going to apply to you because you can also still have, you know, messages being spawned out within your, your ESB or your broker that's going to start creating more and more messages. So that in itself is, is not enough from my perspective, but I think it is important and we'll talk a little bit more of this in the API management section. So the next area is in the area of um, analytics. And I'm going to classify this into a couple different areas. So the first one being your, your enterprise service bus or your integration platform. I'll just use a more generic term. And it's pretty obvious that organizations are becoming more and more data driven. I think from a management perspective, people are relying less on their gut feel and more on you know, pure data. 
And if you look at, a, at an enterprise, you know, likely you'll find that the middleware platform is the heart of the organization where a lot of this important information is flowing through. So if we take a look at some of those examples I provided earlier around, say, quoting or turning someone's power on and off, there's interesting data, valuable data moving through the platform. And I think when I get into my demo, I'll illustrate another scenario why it's important to have some of this analytics, um, you know, being baked into your, your ESB. And, you know, I, I did step away from uh, BAM and BizTalk for a little while, and it was, you know, it was something that I did, you know, find out that I missed a little bit was uh, not having BAM. So it's one of those things is you, now when you need to provide that level of visibility, uh, you don't necessarily want to roll your own, but instead, you know, you want to use something out of the box and, um, you know, have a good platform around it. So moving on to API analytics. So the API economy demands a strong analytic platform. And let me just clarify what API economy means. And it's really the ability for businesses to monetize their digital assets. So if you're a business owner and you want to expose some data, and in return you want to make some money off of it, you want to understand kind of where your investment is going, how people are using your service, what services are being used more frequently, which ones are not, as it allows you to direct future investment. So if we take a look at a company like, say, Expedia, who doesn't own airlines, doesn't own hotels, but what they're really in the business of is exchanging information, right? So this is an area where if they want to understand, you know, where they should be investing within their business, a strong API analytic platform will allow them to do that. And, you know, today I would say a lot of these platforms are disparate, where an enterprise service bus may have some, you know, analytics and an API platform certainly would have some analytics. But in terms of stitching these together, um, I haven't really seen a really good case or a really good solution for this. But I really think this, that's the utopia is the convergence of these different types of analytics, you know, depending upon, you know, what level of granularity you want to get to. So I've compiled a, a couple different examples here. Of these are API management analytics. So in this example here, we've got Azure API management. And what I've done is I've actually uh, built a, an API around an existing third party API. It's the USA Today, which is um, a newspaper in the United States. And what they have is a, an API that exposes Major League Baseball salaries. And you know these are some very simple usage analytics that I'm able to expose or it's exposed to me through the platform. And as you can see, I built this uh, API a couple months ago and I hit it a few times just to see how this would look. And on the, the bottom right hand corner here, we can see we've got, um, you know, Canada, some requests from Canada, some requests coming in from Brazil, and we're able to see the number of, of calls that are being made. Um, if we go into another chart, we'll able, we're able to see some API response times. So this will give us some some good instrumentation around how well our service is performing and from where. So my Azure API management instance is in the West USA region, which is in California. And I live here up in Canada. So we're seeing that the response time is much better for myself due to some proximity and perhaps some better infrastructure than the requests coming in from Brazil, which would be further away. And you know it's definitely taking longer. Uh, for those requests to come back. Uh, similarly, from a back-end service perspective, we're able to see the same level of analytics. So these are just some examples. Um, these are out of the box. It's not even, I had no configuration whatsoever. This is just kind of part of the service that Azure API Management is, is providing. Next, I've got um, kind of a, a similar concept, a similar set of analytics. This is coming from a company called Apogee who is definitely one of the stronger players in the API management suite. And in this case, we've got a series of, of different APIs or products that they're exposing, and we're able to see the different response times based upon the, the actual product or API that, um, that they're actually exposing. So next up, I wanted to talk a bit about deployment models.
And uh, in this case, I really wanted to talk about ensure cloud is really cloud. Now, uh, when I think or consider a cloud-based platform, you know, I automatically gravitate towards self-service provisioning. So me, through some sort of an API, some sort of a web-based interface, um, whether it be PowerShell or REST, you know, I should have the ability to spin up, you know, instances on demand. Um, I expect that I should be able to pay for what I use, burst when I need to, and, you know, basically retract when I need to as well. Um, also, capabilities such as auto scale that might may look at some of the performance of my application that will automatically scale for me. So instead of getting calls from customer servicing, your site's down, your service is down, you know, I should be able to kind of expand and contract as required. Um, I would say if you're looking at a platform and you have to talk to a sales guy in order to get some additional, additional provisioning, uh, you're probably looking at the wrong platform. Um, hybrid is, is kind of an interesting uh, deployment model. I think it's the most pervasive currently um, as people get more comfortable with the cloud and start to move their workloads in that direction. And I'm not so sure there's a single answer here. What my recommendation would be is to understand the different options that a vendor has. Because this is largely a bigger conversation than just a middleware team. Uh, you're generally going to have security very much involved in this type of a decision. Uh, they may be more comfortable doing some sort of site-to-site -site VPN or perhaps even some sort of MPLS, a network level data center to data center type integration. Uh, they may be more comfortable with the relay service where you're able to deploy a small lightweight agent that's going to connect out to the service itself and do some sort of reverse tunneling exercise. That's another option. Similarly, a cloud VPC, you know, may provide more comfort. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, I think the important thing is to have options and an integration platform that's only providing one option, you know, may not be the best fit either. Uh, next, there's obviously still a lot of on-premise integration that's happening, but as people are looking to, to move these workloads, they do want some agility. So, you know, the idea of a lift and shift architecture has been discussed where you're able to really just take your existing code base and really just deploy it elsewhere, uh, zero changes or very little changes, and be very productive. And I think there's some merit in, in that type of capability. And also just the idea of feature parity where, you know, on-premise you're able to do function XYZ, are you able to do function XYZ in the cloud? So those are things that should be considered. Um, there's something, an interesting point that was brought up at uh, earlier conferences with the, the idea uh, as a, we transition to some of these new architectures, there may be a reason not to do that as well. So for example, if we're starting to look at more microservices architectures, uh, it may be a really bad idea to take a, a complex BizTalk interface and move it as try to you know, model it into a microservice without refactoring and rethinking it. So it's something to be cautious of that as we move towards some of these new integration models, we want to really understand what we're trying to achieve and whether or not there's a better way to do it going forward. So adapters. Uh, first, let's talk about line of business adapters. And I think it's important to understand when evaluating different um, integration vendors is whether or not these adapters are full featured. You know, oftentimes you may see an adapter and it's a particular line of business system. It says, oh, that sounds great. That's exactly what I need only to find out that, you know, a certain percentage of the operations are supported. And then it leaves you the with the question, well, how am I going to fill in all these other gaps? I just, you know, bought this platform and this adapter. The business wants this project done, and I've got a bunch of gaps. So I think that's definitely a question worth asking as you go through these exercises. Uh, you want to ensure that the, the adapter is naturally up to date with the vendor. Uh, you know, as vendors provide new releases, perhaps it's an SAP, version, you want to make sure that your integration vendor is following in, in line with that as well. Uh, prerequisite libraries, what are the, the implications or dependencies there? You want to ensure that you know, that's being taken care of and that's well documented. Uh, next, moving on to SaaS connectivity. And I know this uh, point generated some conversation at the Integrate Summit. And it, the question is really around whether or not a REST adapter is enough. You know, with, you know, for example, BizTalk 2013, 
Uh, we now have a REST adapter. Can't we just consume all of these, you know, SaaS-based RESTful endpoints? And you know, my argument is no, I don't think it is enough. And I think largely it's around developer productivity and security plumbing. And I learned this firsthand. Uh, this is on my blog. This is um, from December 2013, but I think it still holds. And it was, I had a, a situation where I needed to integrate with Amazon S3 storage. And so, you know, sure enough, I started digging around the Amazon documentation, and yeah, they had a RESTful API, and they also had a .NET managed API, but I wanted to use kind of messaging approach. So I started digging in and said, okay, uh, this is probably feasible, but then I had to start looking into the intricacies around security and authentication. And so I tried a few different things and, you know, there wasn't a ton of documentation out there. I felt like I was trailblazing to a certain extent. And I, I spent several hours kind of banging my head on my desk trying to figure this one out. And at the end of the day, it was, you know, I did get it sorted out, but it just didn't really seem worth it. It's, you know, a, a similar analogy would be a web developer who wants to, you know, connect to a database. Are they going to develop their own database provider in order to establish that connection. So I kind of feel it the same way. And I think for, you know, the same reasons, you know, having some, some good connectors to connect to these, you know, SaaS based platforms is still a really good idea from a developer productivity standpoint. And then I also don't have to worry about all of the security plumbing because you start doing that over and over and over to these different services and quickly you're focused on writing plumbing code instead of you know delivering that value to the business by solving a business problem so looking ahead um, at the integrate conference microsoft started talking a little bit about future capabilities in this space so we're going to see things um, or components sorry not components but uh, connectors or adapters out of the box in the form of microservices and if you take a look at this list there's definitely a good mix of your typical on-premise LOB connectors, but there's also a good mix of your SaaS-based connectors. So things like Workday, Salesforce, Marketo, um, Yammer, uh, and on and on. So now we're going to have the ability to plug in to these um, different SaaS-based platforms and be able to do it very quickly as opposed to writing all of this plumbing ourselves. Next, moving on to custom adapters. I think there's always going to be a need to, to build some custom adapters, whether you have to connect to a, an obscure legacy system or perhaps it's a brand new SaaS-based system and you, you need to, to build your own connector because something doesn't exist already. And I think in this area, you want to ensure that there's some good samples out there, good documentation. Ideally, there's some sort of a testing framework that the vendor is going to provide that allows you some assurances towards building out uh, some robust connectors. Uh, the next is the area of the marketplace. And this is another thing that was talked about at the Integrate Summit. And I think there's a few different perspectives here. Uh, one is the idea of monetization. So today we do see some third party uh, vendors building BizTalk adapters. And you know I've had some success in the past using them. I'm sure others have as well but it was always a little bit difficult chasing them down, right? It's kind of like, well, you know, you Google it, you may not have heard of this company. Uh, they're in a very remote destination. You're not sure if this is a good idea. Are they going to stay in business? Are they going to go out of business? And, you know, there was, you know, basically some uncertainty around it. Uh, now I think there's a, an ecosystem being developed that in kind of encourages the, the partner ecosystem to build these different connectors and actually be rewarded for that. Um, in the case where people do not want to, um, you know, to go ahead and, uh, you know, they may not be interested in the money aspects of it, but they just want to share their work. This is also a distribution channel where people can publish these to a central location and then people can plug them in accordingly. So I think regardless of your motivation, I think it's, it's a good idea. And I think it's something that more and more ecosystems are looking to provide. So here I've got an example of the Microsoft Azure Marketplace in its current form. So we won't see any BizTalk related connectors here yet, but I think you can visualize or envision what it's going to look like based upon some of this existing work. So here we've got different flavors of virtual machines, you know, whether it be Oracle or Cloudera, it could also be SAP. We've got some application services like Mongo and Redis. 
And then I think this is probably the, the closest analogy is in the area of Active Directory applications, Azure Active Directory applications. Now, in this case, we have Identity Management Federation with other popular SaaS-based systems like Dropbox, DocuSign, Box, Concur. So if you had to build all of the identity yourself to integrate with these different platforms, it's, it's kind of similar to you building connectors. And I think you know, you're going to be a lot more product productive if you're able to just drag and drop one of the connectors onto your canvas and wire it up and start using it as opposed to trying to build your own. I've got a, an example here, another example. This is from a company called SnapLogic. So these guys are the integration, they're in the integration space. And they are strictly an integration platform as a service provider. They've got a very lightweight design canvas. So they're doing integration in the form or from a web browser. And this is an example of their Snap Store. Um, they have what's called a Snap. And really that allows you to plug it in. I think you could look at it as a kind of like a microservice in the sense that, you know, maybe an extreme weight workflow and you need to do some sort of synchronization between Box and SharePoint. And you can just wire those up and drag and drop these different components and basically deploy it and have it run. So there's definitely some other vendors in the marketplace that are doing this today. Um, I don't think that Microsoft is necessarily blazing. Um, I think it's definitely necessary uh, to head down the path that they're headed. So community, obviously you're on this uh, call, you're quite aware of the, the Microsoft integration community. And I think once again, it's just something not to take for granted because you won't necessarily see this same level of engagement from other platforms. There, there are certainly some platforms that are claiming thousands and thousands of developers in their ecosystem, but do a simple Google search and you know, I don't know whether it's warranted. So, but um, anyways, community comes in in many forms. I really feel it is the ecosystem, whether you're an ISV or a partner, contributor, whether it's blogs, being on forms, your side or an influencer. And I think ultimately for customers, there's a lot of benefits in the sense of implementation help. I don't know if there's much anything much encouraging than going out and buying a new platform and then looking to get some help but it's not uh, readily available. So certainly having resources, peer-to-peer -peer support like today, you know, now you've got several different integration experts and specialists on a, a messaging exchange. You can go ahead and ask questions and, and look for additional support. Um, also tools and best practices emerge as a result of a community. So this could be things on, on CodePlex, where we've got the BizBuck deployment framework, we've got biz units, we've got um, the you know performance tools and ultimately it's just a uh, it's just huge for the overall community. Now I thought it'd be interesting to to kind of compare some of the communities that exist out there. And what I stumbled across was a, a website called TechWars.io. So I'm not sure necessarily that this is like the definitive um, you know source of truth or anything like that, but it was the closest thing I could find. And really where they get their information from is through social media aggregation. So they're pulling data from sites like LinkedIn, uh, different career sites, and certainly their own Tech Wars users. So in this case, I've done some comparisons around BizTalk and TIPCO and BizTalk and Web Methods. Um, I'll leave it for you to go visit the site. You can plug in some of those other vendors that we talked about. Um, but overall, I think you'll find that the the BizTalk and the Microsoft ecosystem is, is pretty strong. Um, you know, these are just some of the examples of, of what's going on with this ecosystem, whether it's a, a community in BizTalk magazine by Sandro, um, obviously this user group, some of the other uh, user groups in Sweden, Belgium, Australia, the US, uh, we've got TechNet Wikis, which is, you know, and then we do have conferences like the BizTalk Summit that happened last year in London, um, which from what I understand based on some recent emails is, is going ahead and look for those dates in March um, around the next iteration of the BizTalk Summit. So now moving on to some more forward-looking themes. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about was API management. And I really feel that uh, 
API management is a foundational component of a modern integration platform. Um, I think you know this is something we're seeing more and more of, and uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Now, what's important about an API management uh, platform is, you know, number one, it is going to enable an API economy. It's going to allow for the governance of servers, uh, whether that be from a technical perspective or a functional perspective. We're going to be able to take advantage of service virtualization. Uh, perhaps that could be in the area of legacy modernization where we've got some on-premise traditional SOAP bases and we want to expose them to perhaps a mobile client or to clients who want a lightweight, a lighter weight messaging uh, structure like JSON. So we're able to do those types of things within an API management suite. We also have the ability to cache requests so that we're not going and dipping into backend systems all the time when we need to service this data. We are able to use an API management suite for developer engagement. And uh, this is an important uh, point, I think. So if we look back at my Azure API management example, you know, in that case, I was looking for Major League Baseball player salaries. And there was a couple different APIs that I could have used. Now, the USA Today did a pretty good job of having a developer portal where they exposed examples uh, in different languages. They provided a call, excuse me, kind of a try it now feature. And I was able to, you know, quickly through just like a few strokes and mouse clicks, you know, interact with this API and they found it really easy to use. Now on the flip side, it was, um, you know, I had to, you know, go to another one where it was poorly documented it didn't give me a good sense of you know, how I'm able to um, interface with that, that API. So you can imagine which one I, I chose was easier to use. So I think the idea of a, a strong developer engagement is increasingly becoming more and more important. Um, lastly, I think there's opportunities to take advantage of productivity and code generation through the use of different API markup language specifications. So I wanted to, to jump into a couple of those. So the first one we're going to look at is something called Swagger. So this is something, uh, if you're a BizTalk person and been paying attention to some of the Integrate announcements or even attended some of the recent sessions, it's being, more, it's being discussed more and more. And I think the important thing here is, is understanding kind of what's involved in building an API. And when you think about that, you always want to expose you know, your different resources. So in this case, we have a, a product resource. Uh, we have estimate resources. We have user resources. Then next, we're going to have the different operations we can call upon. So in this case, we have a get product where we need to provide different parameters. So what you're doing at design time is really modeling your API. You're also providing a description. And what happens is, is you now have this API specification that you can use intelligently um, you know, in the case of, say, a mocking service, where now people can you know, kick the tires, per se, on your API by you know, passing inputs and outputs around. It's, it's kind of a, a contract-first you know, methodology towards building um, APIs. And the idea is that you can then take this information and generate artifacts from it. So the next example I'll show you comes from MuleSoft. Now they have, um, I guess I would call it a compute specification called RAML. And in this case, they've got together with a, a few other partners. Uh, they've got some people from PayPal and Intuit and Cisco who are helping them with this specification. Uh, it's very similar in nature in the way that you want to you know, construct this API and design it. Um, in a way that's you know easily digestible for a developer. So in this case, this is actually an API that I've used in my example is I have a policy resource and I'm going to expose a get operation. In this case, I'm going to have a query parameter called the email address. And the email address is then going to go ahead and provide a sample uh, response for a 200. Once I've gone ahead and modeled all of this, I can then go ahead and um, use a mocking service. It's going to automatically go ahead and define this mocking service for me where I can then plug in these different uh, query parameters, 
click a, a get button and then see the actual response come back to me. So now what I'm doing, the advantage of this is I'm able to iterate through the design of my API and you know, get some feedback from other developers without actually focusing on my backend services. So once I'm very comfortable, the mobile developer can go off and start you know, building their, say, mobile application, and now the backend developer can start focusing on you know, wiring up the different backend services that are going to participate in this API. Now, from a MuleSoft perspective, they've done a pretty nice job with this. They've got a, a mocking endpoint that gets deployed to their cloud, and then you can actually go ahead and point at this, you know, from this this tool, or you could use other tools like Fiddler or Postman as well. <clears throat> um, just for just if you wanted to to take a look to see what a real world example looks like. Um, I've got uh, a URL off the MuleSoft site. Here's the equivalent tiny URL. Oops. And what we have here is actually Box. So the, the startup Box that does with, deals with online storage. They've gone ahead and modeled their APIs in both Swagger in this example and in uh, RAML as well. And you can see both of those examples at that particular URL. But as you can see is that this can grow to be pretty big. So if you wanted to expose a large API and you're not using something like RAML or Swagger, you're going to put your developers and yourself at a significant disadvantage because people are not going to be easy, be able to easily consume your API. And another benefit is the idea of them being self-documenting. So as I showed you in that earlier example, you're providing a description of what your operation is about to do. And then you can surface this documentation through developer portals without you having to go write it yourself. I think we all know what happens when you're left to do documentation after the fact. It never actually gets completed. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a way of using contract-first development. I know for some people, they may feel that's a dirty word. But you know, as, as people in kind of the enterprise integration space, I think we've all come to know and love and use things like XSD and WSDL, and but on the mean, in the meantime, we do know that people are moving towards JSON and RESTful services. And I kind of look at Swagger and RAML as kind of that equalizer that allows us to still have some sort of contract between two parties, but doing it in a very lightweight construct. The other thing we can do is that we can generate code. Um, as you saw, those mocking services, you know, what those were was basically, you know, these services that were interpreting the RAML specification and turning that into a service. So kind of consider some of the other opportunities is what if you had a workflow that was able to consume a Swagger or a RAML definition? You could then scaffold out the different, say, you know, methods or operations you want to expose, and it's going to do some of that code generation for you. Um, also, I would consider this, and I don't know this for fact, but if I was building a connector, you know, and I say it was a box connector, I would love to be able to consume that Swagger or RAML definition and basically suck in all of that different metadata so that I could expose that through my connector surface and it would save me a lot of time as opposed to trying to code that all myself strictly by looking at some sort of a document. So next up is the ever so popular microservices. So I'm not going to get into a ton of detail here just because both Charles and Sam have talked about this on the previous chats. So I would uh, recommend you, you know, hit the integration user group website if um, you're looking for more information. But I think some of the key points here is that we're starting to see you know, use cases move away from those large monolithic platforms. And I think you know, it's, it's largely related to some of those drivers I mentioned earlier around SaaS connectivity and mobile solutions. And you know, I do think that, yeah, we are still going to see some of this you know, enterprise integration happening, but we're also going to see more and more of this lightweight integration. And I think what's important here is if we can keep or maintain enterprise features while providing more lightweight solutions and move away from some of these large monolithic platforms. Uh, it'll give us the ability to, to build out some finer grain services and if we take advantage of container automation, we should be able to scale these things very quickly 
um, kind of at the speed that the business requires and do it in a very methodical manner. So if we look ahead to Azure Microservices and some of the new capabilities that it will provide, we can expect some SaaS connector connectivity, which has, has been lacking to date. Um, I think we can provide, say, some of these non-traditional integration developers with an integration tool set. So historically, if you know, I'm sure there would have been many different use cases where a developer could have taken advantage of, say, a, a, a rules engine, but you know, getting a, an integration platform with a rules engine just was a huge lift that may not be financially viable or just from or very timely uh, to introduce. But now, if you have a rule microservice that you can just wire into, say, your web application or your mobile application, well, now we're going to get more and more of these developers with some of these uh, capabilities or tools that we're all used to seeing. We've talked about the marketplace, and you know, I'm pretty excited about where things are headed there. Um, I think we're also going to see some lighter development tooling experience. So we talked a little bit about SnapLogic and Dell Boomi's the same way. We're able to do some of this integration in lightweight workflows through a web browser. And I think, um, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical in terms of what we'd be doing, like complex mapping and EDI type stuff in, in a web browser. Uh, but I do see it. Like if you look at tools like If This Then That, you know, it's a, a widely popular tool that enables the business developer or a technical savvy business person to go ahead and wire up some very simple integrations through a browser. And I think, you know, that's not going away. And lastly, I think a greater deployment flexibility. And let me just illustrate that in the next slide. So we've got something called the no ESB architecture. And, and no, I didn't come up with this term, actually. I, I, very, I dislike it very much. But I think the, the architecture pattern is something we're going to see more and more of. So this is a, a term coined by Gartner. There's a, a, um, a webinar out there that's available for free called Time to Get Off the Bus. And um, I think the, the point that they're trying to make is that your ESB or your broker is no longer the center of your integration uh, world or universe. Um, instead, we're going to see you know, some sort of service gateway in, in Microsoft terminology. It's the microservice gateway. Um, it could also be an API management gateway. But the idea is that's going to be kind of the entry point and that it, instead of the ESB being the center of your integration, it's just going to be part of your integration. So if we look at this and compare it to where things are going with, with Azure and microservices, you know, I think we can expect BizTalk you know, is going to continue to exist in a lot of these different integration scenarios. We heard Guru talk at Integrate how you know, BizTalk server is not going away. There's still a lot of customers who you know, depend on it for providing mission critical um, interfaces. Uh, there's going to be a new version, BizTalk 2015. And I don't think it's going to disappear because the reality is, is we have some complex um, integration problems that we need to solve that aren't going to lend themselves to a lighter microservice architecture. So I think in this sort of a world, we have the best of both worlds, where if we need to do you know, complex correlation or complex messaging patterns, we're going to continue to, to leverage our, our ESB. But if we need lighter weight services to talk to, say, you know, success factors or Salesforce, we can, you know, build out those lighter weight microservices and have some level of central governance, um, you know, provided through our microservices gateway. So all in all, I think the, we're going to see these two types of architectures converge and we're going to be able to use the tool that, you know, best suits our needs at that time. So quickly, some other considerations when looking at different requirements. Uh, the idea of a roadmap. So this is something that Microsoft and more specifically BizTalk had been criticized in recent years. And that was related to their transparency or lack of transparency. And I, I think that's certainly no longer the case. I think the Integrate Summit was a great example of the new Microsoft world and what um, they're looking to do. Um, so this is, you know, they're being very transparent. We're getting easy, early looks at the microservices platform. Uh, it's certainly up to date, but that's something you want to consider when looking at other vendors. Uh, the next highly debated area is around single vendor versus best of breed. 
Um, obviously, there's some vendors that are, you know, in one camp versus the other. And I think, you know, when considering these, you, you need to look at your enterprise architecture alignment and how does that best fit in. I think if you're using a lot of open source, um, you know, projects or, or platforms today, you're going to feel more comfortable in that space than you might if you had a single vendor. And I think the opposite is also true. If you are, you know, largely dealing with a single vendor today, I think you're in for some culture shock when it comes to introducing those some of those open source platforms. I think it's also important not to get too hung up on the open source and really try to understand the vendor motivation and just, you know, where do they see or how do they use open source versus when is a particular feature not open source and why? So it's just more about better understanding what's involved in that type of a, a platform. Lastly, monitoring. Um, how are you going to monitor your platform? You know, what type of analytics are you exposing? Can you monitor from a single tool? Uh, do you need to buy additional tools? I think these are all questions you want to understand up front before uh, you start writing checks. Okay, so moving on, I uh, want to do a bit of a demo around addressing some of these modern integration challenges. I think in the past, um, you know, Microsoft had been coined by some vendors as being legacy. And the purpose of this demo is really to demonstrate how BizTalk is able to participate in some of these newer requirements that are evolving through, um, you know, SaaS solutions, uh, mobile solutions, API management solutions. So I wanted to, to take this opportunity to demystify uh, some of those opinions and then also show that, you know, while we're waiting for microservices, we still have, you know, a fairly flexible platform where we can take advantage of some of these newer technologies. So in this case, I've got a, a car quotes um, application. Uh, you know, the insurance business has has typically been a, um, you know, a, a legacy-based business, but as, you know, customers are demanding more agile solutions, uh, you know, they've had to respond. So we may see a business looking to, you know, move away from an on-premise customer information system and move more towards a sales force where they can track opportunities and, you know, basically give their, their salespeople who are out in the field better tooling. Uh, so that would be one area of uh, business transformation. Similarly, we would have, um, you know, mobility. And, you know, how is, you know, BizTalk going to participate in some of those use cases? And in this case, you know, the reason why we would want to use something like BizTalk would be really around some of the service composition, where when we need to assemble a quote, we're going to be tapping into, you know, a bunch of these systems, actually all of them, in order to establish that quote. And that's not something that a, a point to point RESTful API is going to afford. So I'm going to now just jump into the, the mobile ab application that's been built. Uh, this is a Windows 8 application. I'm going to go ahead and log in. I've got some of the different features, whether um, personal information. So in this case, this would be my demographic information that's coming back from Salesforce. Um, this is all obviously fictitious, but there's a few kind of important data elements here, uh, the state and the date of birth, because these would be considered rating factors that we'd want to pass into our rules engine to help establish a quote. Um, if we take a look at my current policy, you can see I'm driving this big gas guzzling SUV. And uh, when I initially built this demo, oil was at 90 bucks a barrel. Now it's at about 48. So this uh, demo may not hold as much water, but the idea was that, you know, I'm tired of driving this big gas guzzling SUV and getting hit with, uh, you know, an environmental tax because uh, it's, you know, got all these different cylinders and whatnot. And I want to look for a, a vehicle that is, um, you know, more energy efficient and one where I can actually get a discount from, you know, the, the government for driving a uh, more environmentally friendly car. So, in this case, I just won the lottery and I wanted to take a look at one of the new um, BMW i8s. And we can see that it's the premiums a lot less. It's $34.99 per year. So I can go ahead and purchase this policy and I should get an indication or confirmation uh, indicating that that was successful. I can now go back to my current policy and we should see that the BMW is now in the, in the current policy. So 
just to summarize So just to summarize this solution, uh, we've got legacy modernization, we've got SAS connectivity, uh, we're using JSON, uh, we're still leveraging a rules engine. So these would be uh, some, of, certainly some of these would be characteristics of a, a more modern platform, um, but we're able to use BizTalk uh, to actually participate in this type of a solution. Now, some future additions. So in this particular demo, I didn't actually include API management. It's something I, I certainly could have. Um, you know, in this case, I was exposing the BizTalk endpoints um, as RESTful JSON endpoints. And also, I could add some analytics. So this would be a perfect example of why I would want to use a combination of the API analytics plus the actual on-premise analytics as well. So you think about, yeah, it's great to know that I've got all of these requests coming in from, say, Washington State, you know, and it's taking this long for the, the interaction to take place, but what about the actual data that's being passed back and forth? Like, how many requests do we have for, you know, the, that BMW, and how many of the requests are coming in from people aged between 20 and 30? So as a business owner, you can imagine that all of this information is going to be extremely vital to you in terms of how you're going to create different products that you can actually sell to your customers. So I know we're almost out of time, so I'll move through this rather quickly. Um, the white paper was something uh, brainchild, I guess, of myself, Michael Stevenson, and Steph Jan Wiggers. Uh, it was just, you know, we every day you log into the web and you kind of see these different advertisements and kind of feel that there was a lot of kind of mudslinging going on and it was time to kind of look, you know, focus on fundamentals and, you know, much like if you're involved in a, a project today, there's going to be some sort of business requirements. And if you're choosing a, an integration platform, why would it be any different? So I've got the tiny URL here. Uh, the white paper is hosted on BizTalk 360. It's available for free. Uh, so go ahead and, and download that if you wish. Uh, open for any kind of feedback or things that we've missed. Uh, we've talked about updating it as, you know, microservices evolves and we see the integration landscape to continue to, to be challenged and, and, and to be changed. Lastly, I will leave you with some resources. Uh, there's my blog, my Twitter handle, LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out to me through those different channels. And I guess, um, at this point, I can take a shot at some questions. So Michael Saravana, is there, um, what's the best way to do this? Is there through the chat window or through the site? 